So we focus on, in this case, uh, morphosyntactic change, right? So this is on page in your book, 80 to 81, right? So I ask you to do this. So there will be lots of homework assignments in this class. Um, so um, in place of quizzes, right? I know that you guys perhaps do not like to take quizzes, so we do homework instead. But we have to make sure that you guys do it, right? OK, so the verb, so morphosyntactic changes have to do with um, the changes that deal with uh, how you put word endings or you cut out some parts of the word, right? Or you change some grammar, some grammatical pattern. Right? So in number one, the verb sculpt and the noun, the noun sculpture. So you see that they give you the, the verb sculpt first, right? And then the noun sculptor as a second one. So what, uh, what morphosyntactic change that we are focusing on here is what we call back formation, right? Because we uh, make up the verb to, to sculpt from the now sculptor, like that, okay? Um, for number B, we didn't talk about that, but after the midterm, there will be one there will be one full topic on full discussion on that, so we'll skip number B. Uh, number B is a grammatical change where you change a full verb, uh, magan, which is the verb may, into an auxiliary verb. So this one is dif dif different, and then it needs uh, one full class discussion for that. So this will be after the midterm. Uh, number C, skate with an S, you see, skates with an S. And now we have the singular form skate, right? So we have the singular form skate. So sometimes people misanalyze, right, based on analogy. Remember, examples of the word peace. Uh, when we borrow these words from French or cherries uh, and cherries, already there was an S after these terms. But people, based on their analogy with singular and plural nouns in English, they think that P with an S is a plural noun. So they derive the word P out of it. So here we say that it's based on analogy, but uh, it's false analogy, right? So we say a false analogy, right? Based on their analogy with uh, singular and plural nouns in English. Because when we first borrow the word skate already has an S, but it's used in the singular sense, right? But then people derive the word skate without an S, uh, right? Based on that analogy, okay? Number D, charter house. Uh, charter house uh, has the meaning of charitable institution, but it's originally a Carthusian monastery. Carthusian is like a sectarian, uh, a sect, a different group of people who believe in uh, Catholicism, right? So people, uh, think that this word, Carthusian, uh, is the word charter, right? So they kind of misunderstood. So this is what we call folk etymology, right? So folk etymology. Because people try to uh, find a word that they could uh, associate with, but they misunderstand, right? So they think that Carthusian sounds like charter because that's what people in this uh, religious uh, group uh, do. That is, they try to give donations to other people. So they think that, oh, uh, Carthusian sounds like charter, so let's change the word to charter, like that. Number E. Um, in Old English, we have ik, which means I, which, which means we too, but we don't have that nowadays, right? We only have we all, meaning many people. We don't have just two people, we too. So in this case, we only have uh, I and we in the, in the modern sense, in the modern form. So we say that there's loss of, uh, loss of person in here, meaning the second person, the dual person, we too. We don't have that. Number F in Old English, which we'll look at next, uh, next week, 
uh, there are two, um, actually there are three grammatical genders. If you study French, if you study Spanish, you'll know that there are genders, right? Different genders, feminine, masculine, neuter, in everything, even though they are not animals, they are not objects, they're not people. So a table, for example, has a grammatical gender. In Old English also, we used to have grammatical genders, like three genders, uh, masculine, feminine, and neuter. Uh, like weave man, uh, which means woman. You might think that, oh, weave man must be feminine, right, in terms of gender, but no, it's not natural gender but it's grammatical gender, which means that it doesn't have to do with your natural sex, natural biological sex at all. So in this case, you have um, the loss of uh, gender, grammatical gender in English, right? So this will become clearer uh, next week when we talk about masculine, feminine, and neuter in Old English, okay? Number G, acorn from acern, but but people think that it's believe, people believe that it's from oak plus kernel, the kernel of oak, right? So they think that this acorn is made out of two words together. One is oak, the other one is kernel. So this is again, folk etymology, right? So folk etymology, because people misunderstood, misunderstood the origin of the word. Uh, same as number H, okum, uh, which is the way in which you, uh, the, the material, the material uh, with which you use to um, prevent the leaks of uh, a ship or a boat. So you, you do okum, you put okum in order, in order for water not to come into your boat or your ship, right? So okum doesn't mean that it's from uh, akumba, which is flax fibers, right? But it's from A, out, and semba, to comb, like that. So this is, again, folk etymology, because people misunderstood the origin of the word. So you guys, already? Um, so semantic changes have to do with changes in meaning, right? Changes in meaning. So uh, typically, changes in meaning come in pairs, different pairs, uh, two different, two opposite processes. So the first pair is generalization and specialization, right? So generalization, you try to generalize, you try to extend the meaning, right? From something more specific to something more general. For example, holiday from holy plus day, right? Holy, the days that are holy, like Christmas, like uh, Easter, the Easter, like that. So actually the days that are holy, the days that uh, you can rest because of your religious belief, like that holy days, right? But now, uh, nowadays, we use the word holiday for everything, every day where we can rest at home, right? Where we don't have to work. Uh, doesn't matter what, what days those are, like Labor Day, Children's Day, like that, but these are not holy, right? So in this case, we have generalization, right? So from more specific, which is only days that are holy, right? Uh, re uh, related to religious belief, but now we use holidays with any day, like Labor Day, Child's, Children's Day, and so on, okay? So sanctuary, again, uh, san for, from, from the word sanctus or saint, right, saint. So, so sanctuary is a place of saint, like that, like religious place in the beginning of uh, the use of this word. But we use the word sanctuary nowadays for everything, like, uh, Hanyang is my sanctuary where I can rest, where I can have comfort, like that. So any place where you can have comfort, no, not for you, right? <laughs> so last, again, last is desire, but general, general desire. But nowadays, only for sexual desire. This is the opposite, right? This is specialization because it goes from general, more general, which is desire, to sexual desire. Uh, gestation, gestation, more general carrying, carrying to carry something. But nowadays we use it in the sense of pregnancy only. So uh, gestational is an adjective form. So pregnancy, uh, pregnant like that. So gestation, pregnancy. Uh, when you see the word gestation, you know that it means pregnancy. So this is specialization. Uh, stool, which uh, used to mean uh, a chair. So a chair could come in many shapes and sizes, right? 
but only um, for nowadays, only a chair that doesn't have a backrest. So a chair that only has the seat without the backrest here. So only the seat here will, call, will be called stool, a stool. Right? So this is uh, a specialization, right? So some, from broad to, to more specific examples. Uh, the other process, uh, again, you have uh, one pair, right? The, the opposite processes. Uh, we have pituration. Pituration means worsening, right? To become worse. And then ameliorate. Ameliorate is to improve. Is a verb. Ameliorate means to improve. So we have two opposite processes here. So complement, which means to fill up, right? To complete. But now we use it in the sense of praise. So it's improving, right? So this is amelioration. Uh, nice, <laughs> which used to mean silly or simple. Right, so kind of negative, right? This is too plain, too simple, right? Silly, like that. But now it means good or detailed. So this is improving or amelioration. Uh, shrewd uh, used to mean wicked, but now we use it in, in the sense of smart, which is better. So uh, improving, shrewd. Um, corpse, body, right? So, but now only dead body, so this is pituration. Uh, surly, last one is surly, not surely, right? There's no E here, so be careful, surly. So from sir, S-I-R, sir, like, like a sir, like a master, like that. Like a sir, like a master. But nowadays, if a person behaves like that, like a master, like a sir, is it good or bad? Bossy, not good, right? So it's unfriendly, bad temper. Like, a surly uh, waiter, a surly waitress at a restaurant is not good. Bad temper, gloomy, unfriendly, like that. So this is an example of pituration, right? Pituration. Um, weakening and strengthening, another pair. Um, for weakening and strengthening, we are talking about the effects, okay? We are talking about the results, the results of those words or those um, expressions, the results, not the process, but the results. So for example, uh, when you say, I'm dying to, to study, I'm dying to study, it means I really, really want to, right? But it's not that to the extent of dying, right? But you are trying to indicate that I really, really, really want to. So in this case, the, the meaning of dying is weakened, right? So this is the result, right? The result. The, 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 the meaning of dying is weakened, right? Freezing also, freezing to the point of freezing, but when you say, oh, I'm, fr I'm freezing here, you mean that you feel that it's cold, right? So not exactly freezing, so it's kind of an overstatement. So it results in the weakening of these expressions, right? Uh, famish and starving also, starving, uh, you know, to the extent of uh, you can die from not having anything to eat, but when you say that, oh, I'm starving, it means you are really hungry, but not, not to the extent of the original meaning, right? Uh, that's terrible, which means that, that terrible is that which causes terror, right? Terry, terror. But uh, in the sense of that's bad only. So you weaken these expressions, right? Um, on the other hand, you have the strengthening process where you strengthen uh, the uh, the general words, right? More like softer, softer words in order to mean something stronger, in order to convey something stronger. So that's why we call it strengthening. So for example, uh, the word growth, you can use it with bad, bad tumor, right? Like cancer, right? Uninhibited growth. So meaning that you cannot stop it from growing. So you can use it to mean cancer, like that. Uh, condition also, condition uh, the quality of your feeling like that, uh, the quality of your physical um, strength like that, but, you, but nowadays we use it to mean disease, like this is a medical condition that needs treatment like that. This is a medical condition that needs treatment, so it's a disease kind of thing, right? Disorder or disease. So uh, the meaning of condition is strengthened, right, to mean disease. Uh, person of interest, um, person of interest, 
not that they are so interested in you like that, but uh, you are a suspect that they want to put in jail or they want to investigate like that. So the meaning of interest is strengthened, is heightened, right? Uh, Pre-owned uh, to mean use, right? Uh, ethnic cleansing to mean genocide, meaning to kill that ethnic group like that. Cleansing is to clean, right? Uh, sleep with, make love with. Uh, so sleep with, just, just go to sleep, not like that, right? But uh, we use it to mean to have sex with, right? Not just sleep, right? Or not just make love, right? So, so we strengthen the meaning of the original uh, expressions. Typically for euphemism, you know, euphemism is to avoid saying offensive things, uh, to make it sound less rude, less impolite. So you try to euphemize um, these expressions, the, the, the softer expressions. So you, in effect, you, you strengthen the meaning. Uh, phonetic euphemism also, uh, God instead of G-O-D, God, uh, darn instead of uh, damn, like that. Shoot, shoot instead of shit, like that, right? Uh, written euphemism also, S O B is not sub sub hada, not like that, not sob, not crying, but son of a bitch, like that, right? <laughs> so different, different. So it's softer, right? Softer. So you weaken. Uh, uh, <laughs> you, you, you try to make it less offensive, right? Uh, SSDD, uh, well, maybe you wonder what it is. Same shit, different day. So, so if I ask you, oh, how are you doing? SSDD, same shit, different day. <laughs> Meaning you do the same kind of boring things, but it's a different day, right? So you repeat doing the same kind of boring things every day, same shit, different day. SSDD, how are you doing? Same shit, different day. So boring things, but you have to keep doing them anyway, like that, okay? Um, figurative shifts, this one you don't have um, the, the other opposite uh, process. So figurative shifts have to do with transfer of meaning from one referent to another sim, uh, similar referent involving metaphorical extension. So you use something that's more basic for, and extend the meaning for something that's uh, more abstract. So something more concrete to something more abstract, right? So for example, metaphors like head of a nail. So of course a nail cannot have a head like this, but from the, from the, uh, from the appearance of a nail, you might think that, um, so this is a nail, right? So nail like this. So you might think that this part resembles a person's head, right? So this part resembles a person's head, so you call it the head of a nail, right? Or hands of a clock. So you, you, when you look at a clock, there are two, two main, right? Two main uh, kind of uh, sticks that, that come out. So you, you compare those things to hands. So hands of a clock like that. Um, or uh, shoulder of the road, uh, the area where people can walk or the area where your cars are not supposed to go in. Um, tongue of the land is like the peninsula, the part of land that sticks into the water, the peninsula. Uh, lip of a glass, the top part where you drink from, right? So lip of a glass. Uh, people say that um, the thinner the lip of the glass is, the better, because it will not be in your way of tasting wine or soul or anything like that. So the lip, the top part where you drink from, right? So um, it, has, it should be thin, because if it's thick, you cannot taste the, 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 the drink so well. Like, so look, let's say that this is a wine glass, right? So here. So this, is, this part is called the lip, right? Just like the lip of a person, where you drink from. It should be thin, right? Other parts can be thick. Other parts can be thick, but this should be thin, the thinness part, because when you taste the wine, uh, you p might taste it better. That's what, what people say. Um, metonymy um, is a different thing where you use a part to represent the whole or the whole to represent the part. 
So new blood to represent a person, right? Part of a person blood to represent a person. So we need some younger bloods. We need some new bloods into Hanyang like that. So new people. Uh, old face, you use just the face to represent the whole people, right? Uh, the roof, how many roofs are there in this neighborhood to represent the whole thing, the house. The paper, uh, the paper where a newspaper is made from, right? To represent the word newspaper. Bread, like, oh, I cannot even buy my bread. My, my salary doesn't allow me to buy bread. So it means food, food in general. Not just bread, but means food. Uh, runners, uh, shoes, right? So the things that you use to run with. Uh, room and board, board here is the eating table, like that. Uh, synesthesia, uh, so mark this because I'll put this on the exam because this might be new to you. Uh, it's a sensual word that is used in a non-sensual domain. So it has to do with sense, right? Your sense, like uh, smell, touch, uh, what else, taste, like that. But when, you, uh, when they undergo semantic changes, especially figurative shifts, um, these sensual words are no longer used in the sensual domain, right? For example, uh, a flat note. A flat note uh, does, cannot, uh, typically when we use a flat note, uh, we talk about boring things. Doesn't have to be in the sense of sounding only, right? Or a quiet color, right? How can, uh, how can color be quiet, right? So this is the sense of hearing, right? But a quiet color is like boring color, simple, plain color, like that. Not uh, um, shocking colors, right? Not pink, like that. Not, not green, bright green. So uh, dull colors, like that. A bitter experience. So how could experience be bitter? This is the taste, the taste right? Uh, sense. Uh, so it means negative experience, right? Uh, cool reception, how could reception be cool like that? So this is good, warm reception, or n not good, not good. The, the good one is the warm reception. Cool reception is when they pay no attention to you like that. Uh, hot news, news that need attention like that. Um, bright idea, how could I, an idea be bright, right? But this is the sense of seeing, right? So bright idea means something that's good, right? Something that's new, something that is illuminating something that's like um, uh, shockingly good like that okay so this one is also a figurative shift right but in for senses only for the five senses only okay and um, this is the last I think the last process social and cultural changes will have um, an impact upon the use of words um, there are two kinds of social and cultural changes that, there are two kinds of effects, um, the overt prestige and covert prestige, right? So overt prestige, overt has to do with something that's, um, that everyone knows about. Overt is obvious, right? Overt means obvious. So prestige that everyone knows about. So for example, uh, when you go to your grammar class, when you go to writing class, they'll teach you how to spell things, right? So this is how you spell words. This is how you uh, use uh, a particular grammatical structure like that. So it's overt in the sense of it's being taught explicitly, right? It's, it's, it's something that everyone knows, everyone is aware of in your society, right? So overt prestige from upper class and authorities. So people, some, some people will try to imitate those upper class people or authorities in order to sound more prestigious, right? In order to borrow the prestige uh, from them, right? So we use technical terms, right? To sound like you, ha you, you have a good education. So to sound like you are educated. So we use uh, technical terms from different uh, branches from different uh, dis disciplines like psychology, inhibited person, like a quiet person. So instead of saying, oh, Chris Dye is a quiet, shy person, you say he's inhibited, right? So this, from, this term is from psychology like that. So it's overt prestige because when you use these words, you borrow the prestige, you get the prestige from these words, right? You sound like you are educated, you sound like the people who use them like that. Extrovert people who are outgoing like that. Uh, neurotic, compulsive, and so on, right? Sociology, we have peer group, lifestyle, role model, right? So peer group, instead of saying your friends, 
So you say, oh, this is my peer. <laughs> this is my peer group, like that. Uh, computer, we interface and network with other people and so on, right? Input our information and so on. So some people will not understand what these words are if they don't have that particular um, experience uh, with these disciplines like that. But on the other hand, we don't just borrow prestige, right? Over prestige. We do use covert prestige. Covert prestige is only uh, specific to a particular group. Right? So specific to a particular, perhaps, age groups, right? age groups or social classes. So uh, you use slang that uh, people will not teach you in language school or in English classes or in, in my Korean classes. They will not teach me like Korean slang like that. So, but we use covert prestige right? in order to sound like people who we associate with. Right? If you try to, sound, uh, try to sound like impressive all the time, it will not work all the time, right? Only in some situations. But so we will have to use covert prestige um, uh, expressions from our friends, from other people to sound like those people, to sound close to them, to sound like you belong to that group. So we, we use slang and then uh, clipping is common in slang also. Clipping meaning you cut some part of it. Uh, jazz from jism, J-I-S-M, jism, like that. Uh, jism means something that uh, gives you excitement, like that. Mob, mobile, uh, vulgus, like that. So uh, com movable common people and so on. So proposition instead of just propose, proposal, instead of that it means sexual flavor. Leak means to disclose information and also to pee. I need to take a leak means to pee like that because leak is from water leaking, right? That's the original meaning. But uh, so other things can leak like information to disclose information or pee even, right? So these are uh, like slang terms that people use that uh, you might want to use them to sound like those people. Um, and there are no, and there are some factors that impede change. Also, we talk about things that change, right? But there are factors that impede change. Uh, for example, in writing, change is slower than in speaking, right? Because in writing, it's over prestige, right? You go to class. Uh, this is what people write. This is what appears in social media. This is what appears in newspapers or. Um, or official documents. So change in the graphic system in writing is, is, is slower than change in speaking, right? Because uh, you don't have uh, police that will give you tickets when you mispronounce things or when you use words in, in the way that you want. So, but graphic system writing, you have people and you have models, right, that you can see. And f prestige also, people feel speaking or writing in a particular way may be more prestigious. But uh, again, we have two, two types of prestige, right? Covert and overt prestige. So um, the covert prestige will kind of uh, balance out, will slow down, will downtone the, the speed of the overt prestige and so on, okay? So we are done with uh, that chapter. Now what we'll do is we'll go to this chapter. This will be difficult, so, but, and also it's important, right? So we'll look at, so from now on, we'll go into the real history of English. But before we talk about English, we have to look at what English was before, or what it was like before that was English, right? So we study prehistory of English, right? So English comes around on the scene in the fifth century, so around the year 500, right? Fifth century. Uh, the fifth century. Uh, what about before then? What what did people speak before then? Right. So we'll talk about Indo-European languages and the concept of language families and historical comparative linguistics. So today, so uh, so these are assumptions that you should have. Any child born into a linguistic community, let's say Korean, let's say Thai, let's say English, say Spanish, whatever, can learn that group language easily. So that's just a basic thing that people assume, right? Uh, all languages are able to express whatever speakers need to express. And so, in that sense, all languages are equal. So there's no language that's purer, more pure than other languages, nothing like that. There's no language that's better because 
all languages are the same in that uh, speakers will, will eventually will ultimately find out a way, find a way to say what they want to say, even though they don't have a particular word for it. Right? So uh, in 1786, in 1786, Sir William Jones, Sir William Jones was a British people who was sent to India, right? India was uh, a, um, and at that time, India was part of England, right? As you know. Um, so Sir William Jones was sent to England. So he came into contact with languages like Sanskrit. Sanskrit uh, is an ancient language of India like that, Sanskrit, and, um, but, but he's not a linguist, right? And he was a judge sent to India, right, for work. Um, so, but he had interest in language studies. So he, he noticed uh, similarities, similarities between Sanskrit, an ancient language of India, and Latin and Greek. Latin and Greek are Western languages, right? Sanskrit is an Eastern language language, right? India. So uh, Latin and Greek are Western, but he noticed because of his interest, uh, he noticed similarities between Sanskrit and Eastern language and Latin and Greek Western languages. So he argued that Sanskrit was more perfect than the Greek, more copious, meaning uh, it has a lot of endings, like verb endings, than the Latin right, and more exquisitely refined, meaning pure, than uh, Greek and Latin, yet bearing to both of them a stronger affinity, closeness, uh, resemblance, like that, similarities, uh, that could have possibly been produced by accident. This is a good uh, observation, but it's wrong, right, because we studied before, right, that all languages are good, right, that because uh, you can say what you want to say, even though you don't have words or grammatical structures for it. Like, let's say Korean doesn't have, a lot of people say Korean doesn't have pa the passive voice, the true passive voice. Even though there are some minor cases uh, of passive voice, like tanghada, like that, but Korean doesn't have. But you can still, instead of saying, oh, I, I am loved, or I was loved, you say sarangul patta, like that. So there's no... Uh, even though there's no passive voice in Korean, people can s express the same idea, right? So all languages are equal. But here, what, what did he say? He said that Sanskrit was more perfect, it's better, it's more copious, it's more, let's say, refined, it's purer, and so on. So there are some wrong assumptions here. But what is good is here, that they bear a stronger affinity, meaning they are close to each other. So he noticed uh, similarities between an Eastern language and uh, Western languages like Latin and Greek. So this is actually the beginning, you know, this is the beginning of linguistic, modern linguistics. Before this, even though there were people who study grammar, there were people who study like word usage, uh, those people are uh, more literary scholars like Plato, Socrates, Aristotle for rhetoric or for literature. But this is the beginning of modern linguistic. So, uh, the modern linguistic uh, start with historical comparative linguistic, where they really study and compare languages. And when you, f when you find the same or similar words in a group of languages, those languages may be, may be related historically. And those similar words are called cognates. Uh, why do we say maybe, right? Uh, let's see. Similarities in languages led people to see connections that explain them and so on, just like uh, what interested um, uh, William Jones, Sir William Jones, right? Uh, why do we say maybe here? Because they may be related because you have so similarities, right? But also it could be that you have um, different cases of borrowing. For example, um, in Korean, you borrow a lot of words from English, right? For example, fighting, fighting, like that. So fighting, so, as, so when you see two similar words, you cannot jump to the conclusion first that, oh, they must be related. Because Korean has the word fighting, like that. Uh, doesn't mean Korean is related to English. Somehow, right? But not, not historically related as in 
as in the sense that we are talking about here, that one, one language originates from another language, not like that. But uh, in Korean, uh, we have the case of borrowing. Right? So people like Sir William Jones are interested in similarities. So they think that languages are related historically, meaning one language uh, originates from another language, right? So they are related in that sense, not in the sense of borrowing. So when they uh, compare different words, compare similarities and differences, they put them in families, you know, word families, just like f how we put people in different families. So like this, you see English, German, Swedish, and Finnish. And you compare, let's say, the first 10, the, the counting terms for the first 10, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 2, 10. And then German, eins, one is eins, two, zwei, three, dre, four, via, and so on. And then Swedish, en, twa, tre, fira, fem. So you see the similarities in here, right? One, uh, let's say one start with the vowel, right? One, uh, two, t, z, t, three, d, t, like that, four, v, f. f. Uh, even though they are different, like F and V, but they're related in the sense of one is voice, one is voiceless, like that. So it's possible that a voiceless can become voice like that, right? So it's in the realm of possibility, right? However, if you compare these three to Finnish, you say that they, they are so different. How could an F become an N, like that? So they're to totally in two different groups of, of sound, right? Uh, six, and then one is fricative, one is K, like so strong, stop, like that. Um, or 10 and K and so on. There's no systematic uh, kind of uh, change patterns between English and Finnish. Or, so we say that English, German, and Swedish are closer to each other, right? And Finnish might not be one of the uh, descendants, one of the languages, the daughter languages of English, German, and Swedish like that. So this is how people compare and contrast languages. So. After, after tons and tons of work put into this, uh, maybe you don't see this on your printout because uh, this is color coded. So uh, here, people put language, uh, languages in the world into different families, right? Uh, we will focus on just one family of which English is a part, which is Indo-European, right? Indo-European is the uh, family of English. But you should be aware that there are at least one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven families for the, the, all the languages in the world. This is just an estimate number also, right? Uh, English is coded with this kind of bright green. So what do you see? The US here, right? Australia here, and many countries in the uh, Western world, right? So that share the same roots as English, Indo-European, and also countries in this uh, South America, right? Because they speak, as you know, Spanish. So Spanish is Indo-European also. And here, Australia, because they speak English. And also here, India. India, part of Indo, right? Indo, India. So Indo, and then a lot of Western languages here, but except for Finland. This is Finland here. Finland, Finnish is in a different uh, family, as you can see, Finnish different family, not Indo-European. It's in, Finnish is in Ural Asiatic, right? So you see this. And then you see a lot of uh, Russian and you know, all the uh, minor states that, that used to be part of Russian also in Ural Asiatic, right? And then in Africa, you see the kind of pinkish here, Afro-Asiatic, that's a different family. Where is Korea? Here, right here. Um, actually, Japanese and Korean here, right? Totally different family, not related to English or other languages, right? And then Dravidian in India, this part, Tamil, and so on. But India, Sanskrit, Hindi, like part of, part of Indo-European, right? And um, the island in the Pacific Ocean here, you have Malayo, Polynesian, and so on. But we'll focus on Indo-European, right? Indo-European is, as you can see, the biggest group that uh, extends from this part, the U.S., until India. So it's like almost the whole world, right? You have this uh, continent, you have it in this continent, you have it in Asia also, right? Except in Africa. Oh, one, 
South Africa. South Africa, the official language is English, right? English. So it's in Indo-European also. Now, now this is the spread of Indo-European. We don't know where in people who spoke Indo-European lived before they they went out in different parts of the world, as far as India, as far as uh, as Western as uh, Britain, right? So here, but we from the vocabulary that they use, they don't have words for sea, for example. So we might think that they don't live along the coastal area. So that's that's what we think from the word stock that they use. So perhaps they originated from here, around here, like up north, right? Uh, along, not not on the coast of the Mediterranean, but around like uh, up north, um, let's say this this area, and they moved to around the coastal area. This is Italy in 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 present day, right? So they move around as far as as far as Indo India and Iran, Minor Asia, and also uh, Middle East like that, and. Uh, Balto Slavic, so um, like up north, and then Germanic, this is our uh, ancestor, right? Germanic uh, peoples, uh, different groups of Germanic people, uh, the originator of English, and Celtic people, people who speak Welsh, Irish, like that, Italic, uh, Italian, Spanish, uh, Portuguese, like that. So they spread from here to everywhere. So this is where they originate. So this is our map of Indo-European. So what you have to focus on uh, includes the Germanic branch because you know Proto-Indo-European. This is the originate. The, this is the ori origin, the originator, right? So how does it change into Germanic? How does it change into Indo-Iranian, Italic, Celtic, and so on? This is the topic of today's class, right? Because we talked about before causes of language change and also different types of language change, right? So there must be some changes, including sound change, including morphosyntactic change, including meaning change that happen between Proto-Indo-European and these languages, these branches, right? So must be there must be a set of change, like sound change, that affect uh, Indo-European Indo in order to turn it into Germanic. There must be a different set of change that uh, affects uh, Indo-European that turn it into Baltic, Sla Balto Slavic, and so on. Right. So we'll study that set of change today. Um, so English is where mm, here English. So you should circle here because English is from the Germanic branch, right? Germanic branch, and then for Germanic branch, you you see that there are three ma three sub branches: North, West, and East. So north is up north, right? Up north, including Iceland, uh, Icelandic, Norwegian, right? So Norway is up north, uh, Denmark, Danish, right? So these are up north, so it's one branch. And then we have West Germanic, West, Western Europe, uh, West, Western, um, Western part, not rather than north. We have English and Dutch uh, from the Netherlands, right? And then also German. German is West, and then East Germanic. We don't have that anymore. It's distinct, meaning uh, it's extinct, meaning no, no, no one speaks it anymore. Gothic in the East Coast. So here, English is West Germanic, and it's uh, in the same family line as Dutch and also German. So these guys, uh, they are daughters, right? Sisters, 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 sisters. So English is Germanic, right? Um, and then another branch that might become important later on when we study Old English is Celtic. Not Celtic, right? Celtic, this is K. Celtic, Celtic people live on the island before, before the Germanic people arrive on, Eng uh, arrive on the British Isles even, right? So these are native people of, of uh, Britain, but their languages are not English. Their languages are Welsh in Wales, right? In Wales, like west part of England. Wales, Breton, Cornish, Gaelic, and also there's uh, 
Scottish Gaelic and Irish Gaelic, Irish like that. So these languages are native to England, but they are not ancestors of English at all, right? Just like Native American people in America, <laughs> they don't speak English, right? And, and their languages, their Indian languages are not ancestors of English, just like Celtic people. And Italic, you see that that's why we borrow a lot of Latin, French, or Spanish terms from, um, from this branch, Italic, because it's under same, right? Proto-Indo-European. -Indo so we have Portuguese, Spanish, uh, French, Italian, Romanian. So if you study one language in this, this group, you will have um, no difficulty uh, study another language. If you study Spanish, you can study Italian at the same time because they are so close to each other that, 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 almost the same, that they are almost the same language. Like that. So, so Germanic, Celtic, and Italic are important. Uh, Greek is in one, right? Greek is Hellenic Greek. Greek is before Latin even. But then in Indo-Iranian, you have things like uh, Persian from uh, Iran, and then you have uh, all the languages of India, like, or not all, but many languages of India, like Hindi, which is the official language of India right now. So also in Indo-European. Right, Indo the word proto here means that we don't have written evidence, but we have, um, we have our best guess, best guesses, meaning linguists work out what those words should be by comparing languages that we have records of. So we don't have records of the writing of the Indo-European people because that's like maybe 5,000 or uh, maybe uh, even 10,000 years. So they didn't write then, right, as you know. So we try to reconstruct what the word would be. So that's why we use the word proto. Proto meaning uh, is the linguist guesses, right? Guessing of what those words could be based on our uh, comparing and contrasting all these languages that we have written records for. So this is important. Grimm's Law. Grimm's Law. So we compare so many different languages, right? So Jacob Grimm. You know the Grimm fairy tales, right? J uh, Grimm fairy tales, a collection of fairy tales. Jacob Grimm is one of the two brothers of uh, that family who collected fairy tales, but he's also interested in language studies. So he formulated what we call Grimm's law, right? his observations, to explain systematic differences between the Germanic language group and the Indo-European source language. Again, Remember, I said that there must be some kind, a lot of changes that happen between Indo-European and these groups, right? So one set of change will affect Indo-European Indo and then change that into Germanic. Another set of changes will affect uh, Indo-European and then change it into Celtic, like that. So that's what we will study today. So Grimm's Law explains how um, how Indo-European changes into Germanic, like that. There are so many changes, right? Sound change, uh, morphosyntactic change, semantic change that we study. But we'll just only focus on sound change, okay? Because it's the most systematic and it's the easiest, in the, it's the most well-known, right? So it's called Grimm's Law, it's also called the first Germanic sound shift. So this set of sound changes change Germanic into, uh, no, change Indo-European into Germanic. Right? It's called the first Germanic sound shift. So there must be the second, right? So this is Grimm. So Grimm's law is a set of statements describing the Indo-European stops as they develop in Germanic around the first millennium BC. So th a thousand years before even, right? So this is before even Old English. So here, this is the rules. So there are three separate rules. So you see stops, only stops, right? So we talk about this, this sound change, this set of sound change only affects stops, right? And there are other sound changes that happen, but we will not study, but we'll just only stops, right? So voice, uh, uh, minus voice, voiceless, right? So voiceless, plus voice, voice. Plus voice, plus aspiration, meaning aspirated voice stop, right? 
right? So three groups, right? Voiceless, voice, aspirated, voiced, okay? So in other words, what are voiceless stop? You know, PTK, voice stop, BDG, voice aspiration, B, and then H, DH. H is aspiration, right? It's like B, like that, right? Strong, with puff of air. So these, these are IE sounds, meaning Indo-European sounds, right? And Germanic sounds, you have F, theta, and H, respectively, meaning F turns to F, oh, I'm sorry, P turns to F, T turns to TH, K turns to H in Germanic, including English, okay? So IE, meaning Indo-European. So if you look at this map, Indo-European include everything, right, except for things in the Germanic branch, right? Remember, this uh, Grimm's law is a set of statements that affect in Proto in European and then turn that into Germanic. So you are contrasting ger the Germanic group against other, other Indo-European languages, okay? So if in Latin, if in Latin, we have a lot of Latin words in English, a Latin word starts with a P. In English, you can guess, it will be an F, okay? For example, the word like pater. You know the word, uh, uh, yeah, pa pater, father, you can see that in paternal, right? My paternal side, my maternal side, like that, pater. Or you know the word patriotism? Patriotism, the, f the like nationalistic feeling that you show for your country, for your motherland, like that. So from the same root, pater, father, right? So this is an, uh, a, Latin, a Latin word. It starts with a P. So based on Grimm's law, P will occur in English and in other Germanic languages like German, Dutch, uh, Icelandic, right? As a what? As a F, right? So guess what word it is. Same meaning, cognates, right? These words are cognates. Words with the same meaning and words with the same origin, but they might look different due to some systematic changes. So we have the word father. So, so P turns to F like that. So when you see a Latin word or a Sanskrit word or other, other languages in Indo-European, except for Germanic, right? You can do this kind of sound correspondences, right? Uh, where are we? So P changes to F, T changes to T, uh, theta, TH, K changes to H, and voice, what about the voice? B changed to P, D changed to T, and so on. Voice aspiration, the aspiration is gone, right? H is gone, B, H, D, H, G, H to B, D, G, just like that. So just only three, three, three types of stops, right? Now in plain terms, voice aspirated stop turn into voice unaspirated stop, meaning de-aspiration. Aspiration is gone, the H is gone, right? So ease of articulation, right? You can say that ease of articulation because when you have to aspirate it, you have to put out a lot of air. So when it's de-aspirated, it's ease of articulation, right, that we study. Voiceless stop, stops turn into fricatives. This is possible, right, because Stop, you have to involve the stoppage of air, remember? But fricative, you release the air. Which one is easier to pronounce? Fricative, right? So this is again, ease of articulation that we studied last time. So fricativization, you turn it into fricatives, stops, voiceless stop, turn into voiceless fricative. So again, human beings tend to do something that need less effort, right? Voice stops, turn to voiceless stop. So voice, and voice, voiceless, which one is easier? Voiceless, right? So voice become voiceless, so de-voicing. So three sets, right? De-aspiration, fricativization, de-voicing, okay? So let me return to this. So this one is fricativization, right? The first set, stop, change into fricative, so fricativization. Voicing here, the second set, Voicing is gone. 
easier to pronounce voice to voiceless. And then third set, aspiration is gone, but the voice is still the same, right? The voicing is still the same. So fricativization, devoicing, devoicing in the second set, devoicing, third set, D aspiration, D is away, away from. So aspiration is away, D aspiration. So three sets. So that's where we will stop today, but we'll do exercises. Now, because there's a second uh, sound shift that we'll study next time. So this is just to give you examples. PTK to Germanic, Indo-European, okay? PTK to GMC, Germanic, F, T, H, and H, right? For example, pedis from Latin, pedis. You see pedal, uh, when you ride a bicycle, there's a pedal, right? Pedal means where you set your feet on. So pedis, or when you have pedicure, manicure, when you go to a nail store, pedicure is when they do your uh, toenails. So pedis is food. A uh, foot, right? So we have P. There are other changes, right? The vowel, vowel changes, but we will not focus on those changes. We only focus on stopped now. So P will change, as you can see. Uh, D fricat uh, fricativization, right? P changes to F in English and in other Germanic languages. So P is to foot. Pater, there are two stops here, P and T. So we change to father like that. So fricativize. Uh, tres, which means three, right? Three. So T changes to TH like that. Uh, canis. Canis is dog, right? Dog, as in canine, C A N I N E, canine, English word, which we borrow from Latin. And the origin is canis, canine, like that. So C A N I N E, canine is dog in English, right? We borrow from Latin. But we also have our own native English word, which is hoon, right? Hoon or hound. Um, uh, in Old English, is hoon, now is hound, because of diphthongization and so on. Uh, so C, you might ask me, where is C? We, we, we didn't talk about C, but C is K, right? We pronounce it as K. So this is a K in sound, in pronunciation, not as C is spelling, but K, we are talking about sound change. So the K, khan is to hound or hoon in Old English. Uh, kornu, which is horn, right, horn. So this is also K, right? There is an English word that you might find interesting. It's cornucopia. Uh, cornucopia, uh, that's a noun. Cornucopias is an adjective <coughs> form. Cornucopia. It means abundant. Instead of saying a lot or abundant, you can use this adjective cornucopias. But I don't, I don't know if many people will understand you <laughs> because it's kind of a high level word that you might uh, come across when you study uh, for uh, the GRE exam, for graduate school, and so on. Cornucopia uh, is a noun. Cornucopias is a, a, an adjective form. It means a lot, plenty, abundant, like that. So people associate um, the, the symbol of horn as the symbol of like offspring, of abundance, of rich, riches and so on in, in the old days. So uh, coming back here. So now this is fricativization, the set, right? Now the second set, devoicing, BDG to PTK, turba to thorp, like that, turbulence, like that. Dentist, dental, right, dental, dental dentist, so tooth, D to T, dual to two, right, dual, dual, dual to, uh, granum to corn, you have the word grain, grain, the word grain, granum to corn. This is a K, right, not a C, in pronunciation. Uh, acre to acre, like that. So uh, these are Indo-European or Latin, and then we have these native English words because of the sound changes that we know as Grimm law, Grimm's law. So third one, D, uh, what is that, D aspiration. Um, so prater like that to brother, uh, antero to under, uh, gomon to guma, which is man, right? Groom, groom, man. Um, but in Latin, there's another set of sound change that affect the third group, which is why I have it in a different color. So in Latin, B, H, D, S, G, H will become F, F, and H, like uh, fra frater, infer, and homo. Gumon will become homo, like that, homo sapien. 
uh, homogeneous like that. So we borrow from Latin. But Latin is affected by a different set of sound chains. Uh, so in, only in the third group, right? only in the third group. So some, some, Latin, uh, some Latin words will not make sense to you, especially in the third group, because they are affected by a different, a different set of sound changes. Right? But now at least you know that the IE Indo-European, except for Latin, uh, most Indo-European, a lot, uh, all Indo-European languages will change into G Germanic B, D, and G if they were, uh, if they were, if they were aspirated voiced. Um, again, the change, the change that we see here happens only once. So, dwer, 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 dwer. DH will become just D, right? It's not like DH will be D aspirated to D and then D will change to T, not like that. Or else every, every word will look the same. Every word will become the fricative sound and so on, right? So, only once, affect only once and then for all. And Grimm's law doesn't apply when there is a preceding S before PTK, like sparrows, will change to spear or stella without any, 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 and star without any further change if there is the S that is before the PTK. So that's an exception. Okay? So what we'll do now is we will, you need practice, we'll look at um, your book on page 143. 143 in your book. You guys, we only concentrate on stops. So, voice, so M, you don't, you don't care, right? And they also supply. They also give you the M. So, we only have one, right? One stop, which is where? K. So, K, voiceless, so it changed into voiceless. Stop would become voiceless fricative. So, it would be H. Right, H, and then in English later, H will become W, like that. Germanic languages precede, predate English, remember? Okay, number B, who would like to try? Sukhon? The, which stop are we talking about here? <laughs> M, no, right? M, they give you. O is a vowel, so we don't look at that. So D. So it changed into? Ne, mochan, which is meat. So you can come and get what you want after. Easy, easy right? <laughs> if you think this is difficult, you cannot go on because it will be more difficult next week. Gerb. Okay, wh what are we looking at? Stops, right? So how many stops are there here? to G and BH, right? So the answers will be clear. So who would like to try? This one, easy. Voice change to something that's less effort, that needs less effort. G, in the same place of articulation, but less effort. So who would like to do that? Ko Chan Ho? Ko Chan Ho, try. Show your ROTC spirit. <laughs> G changed into huh? K, right? K. Voice to voiceless, right? Cannot be in different places of articulation, okay? Not D or T. So G is V, la. So same place of articulation but less effort, which is K, right? K. Which is here, right? K. Carve. You pronounce it with a K. And then BH, less effort. What, what, yeah, B, H is gone, right? H is gone. So, Kerban, which is curve, <coughs> and so on. You see that there, there's also vowel change like er into a, ah, and so on, right? Number D, who would like to try number D? You guys? Number D, easy. How many stops are we talking about? Two. GH, GH, so you need one answer only because they're the same. So GH, what changed? Yes, GH to G. Right, so G, like that. And then G, this G stays the same, but the G after 
after a vowel, uh, the G after a vowel or a consonant at the end will change to W later in Middle English. So you'll study that, right? Number E, you guys, Minji and uh, and Miss Kim. <laughs> <laughs> I suddenly forgot your name. So number E. Now work backward, right? Now work backwards. Here, where is the stop sound? K. So work backward. You need more effort. K. Voice less stop. So if you work backward, it will be voice stop. So it would be G. Like that. Number F. You guys in here. Yeah. Number F. Work backward also. There's one stop. B, then if you work backward, BH, right? BH. G spells, spell line, spell. Now, here, what do you think? Work backward. But, again, we study this, that if there is an S, what do you do? No change. So it would be still spell, right? Again, remember, if there is a, an S before PTK, S before stop, no change. S is a determining factor, remember? So it's st still spell, because there's an S. So spell. Number H, uh, since we are out of time, so T, T will change into to T? No, T, uh, TH, yes, TH. Meaning, TH meaning fricative, not, not the aspirate, right? So, uh, fricative, and then I would be T, and then number J to DH to D, like that. So, we will study a different set of change which is related to this on Monday. Right. So whoever answer, you can come and get your treat here. And I will give out the homework, Grimm's Law. For, and then we'll look at this on Monday as a way to do a review.